Have you ever wondered how interconnected the world is? How everything in life seems to be part of a greater plan, this amazing intricate tapestry where different pieces of fabric are interwoven to form a perfect whole. We see these patterns in science, in mathematics, in nature, in economics, even in the relationships that we share as humans. For me, the epiphany of interconnectivity came years ago when I first visited the mountains of Western North Carolina. Here I had a front row seat in this magnificent outdoor cathedral where like John Muir, I learned to slow down and take note of what enveloped me. And the more time I spent here and the more I read and studied, the more I began to appreciate this remarkable place. The Southern Appalachians are among the oldest mountains in the world. These peaks stood once as high as the Himalayas. Two of the world's three oldest rivers are found here. The French Broad River and the New River are just as old as the Nile. Here we have more diverse flora and fauna than in any temperate forest on earth. In fact, one acre in a rich cove forest in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park contains more different types of trees than in all of Northern Europe. There are plants and animals that exist here and nowhere else in the world, including over 268 known species of moss in a single river gorge along the Blue Ridge Escarpment. Here is home to the most diverse collection of salamanders anywhere in the world. Why is this so? And how did this come to be? To help answer this question, we need to go back in time. Now going back in time is not an easy thing to do because we tend to measure time in human scale with the aid of clocks and calendars. But the history of man is an exceedingly small drop in a very large bucket of geological time. The earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago. And over the eons, as the earth's crust was thrust upward and continents collided, oceans formed and mountains appeared. About 300 million years ago, the Southern Appalachians were born. And over time, these peaks were eroded through wind and ice and snow, creating rich alluvial soils and a variety of minerals that were able to sustain a wide variety of plant life. Because these mountains run from the northeast to the southwest, they tend to trap weather fronts that come up from the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. These moisture-laden clouds come across the ocean, across the plains and the Piedmont, and ultimately they're trapped by the high elevation peaks of the mountains. Here, they're intercepted, and these clouds have got to drop their rain in order to rise and move over the mountains. So as a result of this, Western North Carolina has among the highest amount of rainfall recorded anywhere in the world. So rich soils, plenty of rain, all of these minerals have come together to create a mosaic of habitats, each connected to the other in one of the truly remarkable ecosystems in the world today. I grew up hiking and camping in these mountains as a Boy Scout. And over the years, I've come to develop a remarkable appreciation for this place. 20 years ago, I began assembling land along the Eastern Continental Divide on top of Toxaway Mountain, North Carolina, in an elevation of 4,500 feet. To the southeast is a 70-mile view of the Georgia and South Carolina Piedmont. To the northwest, we can see the high elevation peaks of the Blue Ridge Parkway. Ten years ago, we formed a private operating foundation called the Southern Highlands Reserve to grow and display plants native to the Blue Ridge Mountains and to focus on conservation, education, and restoration. We placed the property under conservation easement to ensure that it would remain forever wild and to protect it from development. And over the years as I've spent time here, I've begun to realize how species and ecosystems 
are related in ways that we know and in ways that we're just now beginning to understand. As I think about this remarkable place, I'm struck by the fact that we know so little about where we are. And as we go back in time and begin to understand the flora and fauna here, it's important to step back and understand exactly where we are. Unlike many areas of the world, the Southern Appalachians were never glaciated. The glacier stopped in southwestern Pennsylvania, so rather than coming southward and scraping away all life during the last ice age 10,000 years or so ago, everything that was here is still here today. So we have plants and animals that exist here and in the boreal forests of Canada and nowhere in between. At the end of the Pleistocene era, as the glaciers began to recede and temperatures gradually warmed, many of the plants and animals that had come southward during the Ice Age and who could only survive in colder temperatures were left stranded in these high islands in the sky. One of these species, the Carolina Northern Flying Squirrel, is listed as federally endangered. In fact, there are only nine known populations of Carolina Northern Flying Squirrels in all of North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. Why would this little squirrel choose to live above 4,500 feet adjacent to the conifer forests? Because that's the only place it can survive. That's why. You see, the squirrel is plagued by a naturally occurring nematode called Strongyloides robustus. This parasite doesn't affect other squirrels, but if left unchecked, it would decimate the entire population of northern flying squirrels so that they would disappear. So what's a little flying squirrel to do? After all, it's 30 minutes or so to the closest drugstore in Brevard, and besides that, few, if any, Carolina flying squirrels have cars. <laughs> the Carolina northern flying squirrel survives next to the conifer forest, because that's where red spruce and Fraser fir trees thrive. You see, the squirrel is able to keep the nematodes in its body to a manageable level by conifer oil that it gets from eating the bark of conifer trees. The conifer oil is able to keep the nematodes at bay, and without the conifer trees, the squirrels would disappear. And in a wonderful example of interconnectivity, the squirrel dispenses fungal spores and bacteria through its waste that allow the young red spruce seedlings to better absorb nutrients and water. All of these complex natural systems are really like a brick wall. It takes a lot of bricks to build a wall, and each brick is dependent upon the other in order to keep the wall standing. We can remove a few bricks without affecting the integrity of the wall, but there will come a time as we continue to remove bricks, when we don't know which brick removed caused the wall to fall. As I've thought about the complex relationship between this bioregion and the flora and fauna here, I want to come back to that spruce fir forest because scientists say it's the second most endangered ecosystem in the United States today. Insects, climate change, global warming have all come together to threaten our natural heritage. You see, the conifer part of this forest, particularly the spruce trees, have been under attack for a number of years by a little insect, an aphid, known as the balsam woolly adelgid. This balsam woolly adelgid attacks and kills all of the mature Fraser firs. And at lower elevations, the hemlock woolly adelgid is attacking and decimating our hemlock forests. Sometimes forces that are seemingly unrelated to man come together in ways that we just don't understand. In the high elevations of the Blue Ridge, the forces that we're concerned with are elevated nitrogen levels from fog and from clouds. Insects that have appeared as a result of global warming and drought. 
Any one of the four of these, the spruce fir forest, could likely survive. But the combination of all four of these led to the death of all of the red spruce trees recently on top of Mount Mitchell. Here's what happened. Because the high elevation peaks of the Blue Ridge are covered in fog and clouds most of the time, the, the cloud and fogs trap nitrogen, which comes from acid rain. Well, nitrogen, you say, that makes things grow. And you're exactly right. These trees grew needles and branches at the expense of roots. Elevated nitrogen levels also change the physiology of the tree so that the southern pine beetle, an insect that doesn't normally affect the red spruce trees, have been attacking these trees. On top of that, five years of drought, these trees, which put on all of this growth due to the excess nitrogen in the air, weren't able to develop a sustainable root system in order to be able to fight off the drought. There's so much complexity. Without the spruce trees, the little flying squirrel would die. And that's one reason the Southern Highlands Reserve is growing red spruce trees for the U.S. Forest Service and for the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission to use in reforestation efforts in some of these high mountain peaks. Well, let me share one more example of interconnectivity. And that's the interconnectivity between native plants and insects. Without native plants, insects would disappear. Doug Ptolemy at the University of Delaware has done research that shows that 90% of insects will not eat or reproduce on plants with which they've not coexisted or evolved through evolutionary time. Budlia or butterfly bush is a popular plant for gardeners seeking to attract butterflies. And attract them they do. But not one single North American butterfly will lay its eggs on a butterfly bush. You see, Budlia was imported from China in the late 1700s and it's not native. Without native plants, we have no native insects. And without insects, those animals that depend on those insects to live will disappear. And those animals who depend on those animals who eat the insects will disappear. Everything trickles down. Everything matters. Everything is interconnected. The lessons that we learn from nature provide a lens through which to view the world. But whether in nature, in economics, in science, in our human relationships, one seemingly small inconsequential event can trickle down and have a profound effect far beyond anything that we can imagine. Yes, everything truly is interconnected. And who are we, mankind, who have been on Earth for less than one second in that one year of geological time to decide what's important. How arrogant of us. These mountains have a lot to teach us and we in turn have a responsibility to teach our children and to educate the next generation. And through research and conservation and through study, we can learn a lot about this bioregion, this Katua region, in ways that will better serve our children our grandchildren, and beyond. This is important, and that's my idea worth sharing. Thank you.